Right. Well, good morning again. Sabbath school here at Bethany RP as we get together for uh, Judges 17 and 18. Now, uh, according to our uh, quarterly, this will be our last lesson from uh, the book of Judges. Next week, we'll jump into the book of Ruth, uh, which for those of y'all who've been coming on Sunday nights, this will be a, a, a quick uh, review uh, of a lot of stuff we've already talked about. But uh, today, like I said, we're going to be in Judges 17 and 18. But before we get into all that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we rejoice in this day that you have made and declared holy. And to God, we pray as we come, as we study your word, as we consider your ways. To God, that you would strengthen our mind and our hearts and that you would, again, use uh, your scriptures uh, to show us more of your glory and of your grace. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So today... Uh, Of course, we go to our catechism question first, excuse me, which will be question 20 of the Shorter Catechism. Question 20 of the Shorter Catechism says, Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? uh, And the answer to that is, God having, out of his mere good pleasure, from all eternity, elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace, to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery, and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a Redeemer. So, all of the catechism questions uh, for the last several weeks have been focused upon sin, upon the fall, and upon the effects of sin on the world and humanity in particular. And so the catechism asks the next logical question. Has God left us to perish in the estate of sin and misery. Is that our destiny? Is that what our future uh, reality is? And the catechism has a happy answer for us. Uh, The answer is no. God has not left all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery. And why is that? Well, the answer to the catechism gives us that answer right at the beginning. It says God having out of his mere good pleasure. So, we learn something that we've already learned about God way back in question four of the Catechism. You remember in question four of the Catechism, it it asked and answered the question, who is God? God is a spirit. God is eternal, infinite. Uh, He is also in his being wisdom, justice, goodness, power, and truth. So we know God is good. We know that he is merciful. We know that he is gracious. And because of that, we know that having made mankind out of his own good pleasure, that he would not leave us in our sin, but that he would, in his own way, provide salvation for us. So we're told, again, God, having out of his mere good pleasure... From all eternity, elected some to everlasting life, did enter into covenant of grace, to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery, and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a Redeemer. So now we have the mechanics of how this salvation has taken place. So we need to go back to that good pleasure again for a second. We understand again that God is just. And as a God of justice, what does our sin require? Justice, right? It, it deserves punishment. You know, there, and God would have been perfectly righteous in leaving us all in our sins. Right? That would have been part of God's justice. It would have been part of God's goodness. Because when we think of good, right, we think of somebody who's honest, somebody who is dependable, somebody who is, uh, who can be trusted in every way. And if God has said, Sin leads to death. Would he be just in for getting the consequences of sin? No, right? That would not be just. It wouldn't be good either. Because it would mean that we couldn't trust God. Because we wouldn't know how he would react to a particular situation. And so the constancy of God is part of uh, the reason why he is God. Because things that happen... You know, and we'd be careful how we talk about this, but things that happen outside of God uh, are always dealt with by God 
as he is God. Now, that, that sounds like a bit of a word salad, right? But what, I, what I'm saying is that, you know, the reason why we have faith, the reason why we have hope, the reason why we have assurance is because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That we can count on him to react the same way that he has always reacted to things. And so God is just, and God is just in condemning man to sin and misery for, for their sin. However, he is also just in providing a answer for that sin, right? And that's one of the reasons why the, the whole idea that we have uh, of the Bible uh, teaching covenant theology is so important, right? Because God had made a promise to Adam in the garden. You know, if he did not eat from the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, how long could he remain in the garden? Forever. Forever, right? You know that, and as long as he did that, he was safe in the garden of God. However, if he ate of the tree of the garden uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, what was going to happen to him? He would be cast out. He would die. Right? That's what Satan right tries to finagle Eve with. Right? Surely hath God said. And so when they don't immediately die, what's, what do you think is going in the head of Adam and Eve? Well, maybe the serpent was right, right? We're not dead. <laughs> However, right, you know, what did they all experience? Death. Death, right? So God was not fooling around when he told them this. Now, we get a picture of the future answer for death, for sin, for misery, by what we see God do for Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, right? First of all, we have the covenant promise made in Genesis 3.15, you know, that God would provide a seed from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, but it's not just that. We also get a, a an image of what that's going, what, what's going to need to happen for that to take place in the sacrifice of the animals. Right? The first time blood is shed in the Bible... God is the one doing it, right? God takes the animal, kills the animal to provide covering for Adam and Eve, right? Because remember, when God found them, what 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 were they doing? Hiding, Hiding right? And, and before that, what did they try to do? Cover themselves, Cover themselves right? And the, the the testimony of Moses there is that the covering was not sufficient. Right? It was not able to cover their nakedness. However, who was able to cover their nakedness? God was, right? So we have a picture of the work that God is going to do for humanity in that picture of the sacrifice of the animals for the covering. And the entirety of the old covenant worship is a testimony to these things. And it's a testimony not that the blood of goats and heifers and sheep and the like would be sufficient for salvation, but that they were a picture of that which was to come. Right? So here in the Catechism, when it says that God out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into a state of salvation by a Redeemer. So the testimony is that God, having decreed the fall, also decreed the means by which the elect would be saved. Now, the order of that is something that fills a lot of books, but it's not really necessary for us to figure out, right? Now, when we think about this, so before the foundational world, right, God decreed that there would be a fall. Right. He allowed the fall. How, you know, whatever language you want to use to that. And through that, he also decreed that there would be salvation for a portion of those who were dead in sin. Right? That's the that's what the word elect means. Right? You know, it's not as if God went through and just randomly selected people and said, You're going to be elect and you're going to be a reprobate. You're going to be elect, you're going to be reprobate. Right? That's not how that worked. Right? God you know, in the secret councils of the Most High, you know, testified that they were elect and they were reprobate. But the elect are only elect because of the work of the Redeemer, right? Because of the salvation 
purchased by Jesus Christ. And so the, the catechism now is going to shift into explaining who the Redeemer is. Now, obviously we know who the Redeemer is, right? Who is the Redeemer? Jesus Christ, right? And so the whole rest of the, the catechism, really all the way through the 20s, is going to be about explaining to us who Jesus is and why it is we can trust in him for salvation. I'm going to stop on there, but uh, any questions or, or comments about all that? All right, well, let's go ahead and turn to our uh, scripture lesson today, which again is 17 and 18 of the book of Judges. And much like the other chapters that we've looked at in the book of Judges, what we see here is an example of man's sinfulness, man's wickedness, and the way in which man is destroyed by heeding his own counsel. Uh, one of the one of the things that Samuel is going to do as he lays out the story here uh, of Micah, obviously different from Micah the prophet, but Micah is that he, he's just going to tell us exactly what happened. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's not going to try to hide anything. Uh, he's just going to tell us what happened. And it's our job to read this story and figure things out. Right. Samuel is not going to um, kind of treat us like four-year-olds, right? He's, he's going to expect us to, to, to read and understand. And it doesn't take long, at least it shouldn't take long, to figure out what the problem is here. So let's go ahead and read uh, the first opening uh, portion, uh, uh, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 17. All right. So now uh, there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Michael. Right, so he's of the tribe of Ephraim. And if he's of the tribe of Ephraim, who is the, who's the, the dad of Ephraim? Joseph, right? So this is the one, one of the tribes of Joseph. So, you know, he descends from Joseph. And it's important that you know, if, if they're going to tell us what tribe he's from, it's probably a good idea for us to pay attention to that, right? Now, of course, Joseph... Of all the sons of, uh, of Jacob, right? What do we know of Joseph? Well, he was Jacob's favorite son, right? Um, yeah, I don't think there's much doubt about that, right? Because how many other sons got a, a, a fancy coat? <laughs> right? None of the others, right? Uh, they didn't, people, uh, people in the household of Jacob were not worried about what Jacob was doing for Asher. Right. Yeah, they, they were concerned about Joseph. And so one of the things, too, about the use of Ephraim here is that later on in the Old Testament, Ephraim is going to become a, uh, you know, a short word, if you will, for all of Israel. All right. So we see something here at the very beginning of, uh, of the history of Israel that tells us something about what the future beholds for Israel. Because right, what Micah does is going to be emblematic of what we see from Israel moving forward. So we had this man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even sang it in my ears, here is the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons and became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, verse 6 kind of goes without saying. Uh, because the first five verses of this are an illustration that there was no king in Israel in those days. Because the first thing we hear about this man from Micah was uh, that uh, his mother had 1,100 shekels of silver uh, that was stolen from her. All right. So, you know, the presence of stealing in the land of Israel tells us, right, the nature of what's happening. 
Now, the problem, of course, of these 1100s of, uh, things of shekel, the 1100 shekels of silver, is what had his mother initially intended to do with this silver? Yeah, yeah, you curse it, right? Yeah, and so whoever stole it stole cursed silver. Now, do we have the power to put curses on things? <laughs> right. You know, so what does this tell us about his mother? What do you think she did for a living? She was superstitious. You know, she may have been, you know, whatever you want to call them back, a sorceress of some type. So, for, so here we have a man whose mom is a sorceress. She's put a curse on silver, you know, and it's kind of understood that this silver has come to be hers through ill-gotten gain. Right. So it's already, you know, in, in the right sense of this word, cursed money before it's even stolen. You know, to kind of bring this up into like a 20, 21st century, you know, you know, image, it, it's like, Eve, uh, Micah's mom is a drug dealer and she has had money stolen from her. Now, you know, if a drug dealer has a bunch of money stolen from him, does he go ask the police to help him find his money? No. And, and why, why does he not do that? Because he's, <laughs> he's a drug dealer and you think he's gotten that money through lawful means. No. Right? It's cursed money. Well, you know, instead of Following the law of God in dealing with stolen money, what does Micah do? He goes and steals it back from whoever stole it. Alright, so we have multiple violations of the Eighth Commandment in the first two verses of chapter 17. Now, we also have a, yeah, a violation of the Third Commandment in the midst of this. Because who does the mother bring into this whole deal? The Lord, right? Now, does God bless wickedness? No, right? You know, if you're a drug dealer and you ask the Lord's help in retrieving your stolen money, do you think that's a lawful prayer? No, right? Because we are only to ask the Lord's help in those things that are consistent with His character, right? With His will. So, we have the Eighth Commandment, we have the Third Commandment broken, and now, uh, when he had returned the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver in my hand to the Lord for my son, right? And then what comes next? To, uh, you know, uh, make an idol with it. So now we have a violation of the Second Commandment on top of everything else, right? Because are we to make images of the Godhead? No, right? It doesn't matter if they're pretty or if they're ugly, right? We are not to make images of the Godhead, right? We're not to uh, make images of Jesus. We're not to make images of the Father. We're not to make images of the Holy Spirit, right? We're not to do that, right? Second commandment is as clear as day on this. Now, this is what they want to do with the silver. Uh, they want to make these things. So, that's what they, that's what they do. Thus he returned the silver to his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave him the silversmith, and he made it a carved image, mold image, and they were in the house of Micah. So, these images are made into idols, and they're just sitting around the house of, uh, of Micah. Now, again, we have to understand the, the mindset here. I, what do you, what do you think Micah thinks these idols are doing for him? Right, blessings, right? You know, they're providing protection for the home, likely. You know, in his mind, right, they're providing blessings for fertility, for wealth, for who knows what else is he hoping these idols uh, provide for him. Now, you know, so we have really not just a violation of the second commandment, but we have a violation of the first commandment, right? Because who has Micah placed his faith in? These idols, right? These, the, these silver trinkets that are on his walls. So... He's violated the first commandment, right? The Jehovah God is not the first God of his house. The idols are the first God of his house. And so then we see in verse 7, Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah. Uh, I, I forgot another uh, sin that he had committed. Uh, what do we see him do there in verse 5? Uh, 
He takes one of his sons, and, and what does he do? He's teaching him to work in the idols. Right? He consecrate him as a priest. Well, let's go back to verse 1. What tribe is he? E, yeah, Ephraim, right? So Ephraim, and, and which tribe of Israel is supposed to be the priests? The Levites. Can Ephraimites just decide one day they're going to be priests? No. They have no authority, no power to self-ordain themselves as priests. You know, and again, to bring this up in the 21st century, can you just wake up one day and decide you're going to be a minister of the gospel and ordain yourself? I mean, you can, right? But uh, there's no legal barrier to that, right? You hear this all the time, right? When people want to get married, they have one of their friends get on the internet and uh, get them an ordination from some something, right? And the state, right, which is, yeah, I mean, I, you could probably use verse 6 here to describe the state, right? There's no king in the United States today, but, right, they do what they want. Well, you can't just do that. Right, we there are procedures within the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ established by Christ Himself on how men are set aside for gospel ministry, for eldership, for deaconship within the church. And a, a father is not, you know, in in the sense of what we mean here, a priest in his own home where he can ordain a son to be a priest. You know, that is not lawful. Uh, in the day of the book of Judges, it's not lawful today, right? You can't be self-ordained. But the, the, the double problem here is not just ecclesiastical. You know, as you said, what he's doing is he is teaching his son to be a son of the devil, right? You know, fathers are called to raise their children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, right? That's not happening here, right? He is promoting idolatry to the next generation. And so as he does this, we hear in verse 8, uh, verse 7, Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. All right, so now we have, you know, somebody with credentials, as it were, uh, enter into the story. And he comes uh, to the house. And the man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? So he said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes and, and sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, living in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. You know, I don't think I need to say that that's not how that works, right? Um, you know, again, the problem here is multi-level, right? There is so much wrong going on here uh, that it's almost hard to unpack it in, in a short amount of time, right? Because here we see, right, this Levite, right? And again, the Levites are set apart by God himself to be the prophets of, uh, of Israel, to uh, proclaim the word of the Lord, to uh, you know, consecrate and, 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 and bring forward the, uh, you know, the, the sacrifices in the temple. Right? The tabernacle at this point, but in, in, you know, in the temple in the future. And so the Levite comes in the house. Right? And, and what do you think the Levite sees when he comes in the house? The idols, the idols right? And what should a godly Levite do at this point? Tell him to get the idols out of the house. All right, that's the first thing he should do. But should he stay in a house that is full of idols? No. All right. Yeah. Th there's a you know again to bring this in the New Testament. Right. This is somewhat similar to what Jesus tells the disciples to do. Uh, well, this is an example of what not to do, but this is uh, you know, something Jesus tells disciples do when they go from house to house proclaiming the gospel. If they will not accept what Jesus has taught, what are the disciples to do? Shake the dust off their feet and go somewhere else. All right? They are not to dwell in tents of wickedness in the hopes that if they stay there a long time, 
you know, through their, uh, you know, you know, friendship evangelism, right, they'll eventually convert these people. That's not what Jesus teaches, right, when dealing with sinners, right? We are to be straightforward about the nature of, of sin, the nature of grace, the nature of Christ, and we are not to engage in sin in order to win people to Christ, right? But that's what the Levites do. By his willingness to stay in the house, he is giving approbation to the man and his idols. But it gets worse from there, right? Because we hear him content to dwell. And what does Micah do for the priest? He pays him and gives him clothes, right? You know, again, John chapter 10. Remember Jesus there talking about the great shepherd and himself being the great shepherd. Before he gets into talking about the great shepherd, well, what does he describe? You know, hirelings, right? And, and what do hirelings do? They run away, right? Because they don't consider those sheep to be theirs to take care of. And so at the first sign of danger, they skedaddle, right? And the prophets in the Old Testament describe the Levites like this young man in that way. That why are they serving the Lord? For gain, right? For their own benefit. You know, and if some, you know, again, bring us 21st century, this is basically a bribe and a willingness for a man of God to serve the devil for earthly wealth, protection, safety, all the similar, right? And without getting into specifics, we all know this happens with ministers of the gospel, right? They get comfortable in the outward means of life and they are willing to accept all kinds of evil so that they can have somewhere to live and, and have food on the table and the like, right? Is that acceptable? No, it's not, right? You know, you know, it, you, there is no reason for a minister of the gospel to accept, e accept evil just because he has to put food on the table. Right? That is a testimony to a lack of faith, first of all, in God's provision for his people. But it's also, again, a sign that this Levite does not know the things that he is supposed to be doing. Now, he, he may not, he may know it, right? But he doesn't know it, right? He, he is an idolater just as much as Michael. So he agrees to these things. And so then we see in verse 12, what does Micah do? He consecrates the Levite. Does the Levite need consecrate? No, right? He's already been set aside. But he's now joined Micah's little cult here, household cult, and he's going to be a part of it. So then in verse 18, or in chapter 18, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. As if Samuel needed to remind us of this, but he does, right? There's no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites were seeking inheritance for itself to dwell in, for until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. The children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zorah and Eshtael, to spy out the land and search it. They said to them, Go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. That while they were there at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levi. They turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? And what are you doing in this place? Why do you have, why do you have here? Or what do you have here? And he said to them, Thus and so Micah did for me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. So they said to him, please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we will go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. Again, there is so much wrong in what we have just read. First of all, the problem with the Danites. All right. Samuel tells us, that they were seeking inheritance for itself to dwell in, for until that day their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. Well, whose fault is it that the Danites are not in the land of their inheritance? The Danites, right? Because jump back a whole book of the Bible. Had Joshua set aside the inheritance of the Danites? Yes. 
Where are the Danites supposed to be at this point in time? With the Danites, With the Danites right? In the land of the Danites. But it's evident a couple of things have gone on with the Danites. First of all, they have not taken what the Lord had provided. Second of all, they are not satisfied with what the Lord had provided. So what are they seeking to do? Find their own place to live. But is that for the Danites to do? No. Right? So the Danites, again, are on like fivefold sin you know, at this point in time. Right? They are that they are violating the covenant made at Shechem. Right? They you know they are um, you know denying the, the goodness of God. They are um, you know, you're seeking the you know, the place where the Lord would not have them to dwell. And now we see them come to this land and they recognize the voice of the young Levite. Now, you know, the Levite, you know, is, is not a Danite, right? It's not that he ran from the Danites and happens to end up here. Why, why do you think they recognize the voice of the Levite? Well, all the Levites were trained in the same place, right? So they all sounded the same. You know, and it's not that they all had the same accent. It's that they all had the same manner of speaking, right? So you would recognize a Levite uh, in that way. But also, you know, there's something else about the Levite that they would have noticed. And, and what do you think that is? Yeah, the way he was dressed, right? Because remember back in the book of Leviticus, the Levites are given a particular set of clothing that they're supposed to wear. Now, do you think the Danites expected to see a Levite priest in this dude's house in Ephraim? No. But they're taking advantage of the presence of the Levite, uh, and they know enough about the word of God that what do they want out of the Levite? They want a blessing, right? <laughs> they want a blessing from this Levite. Now, do you think this Levite has much communication with the Lord? No. But is that going to stop the Levite from, from, from doing Levite stuff? No. Right? And, I mean, this Levite is some, something else. Right? So, not only is he in sin for all the other things that he's doing, but now he's breaking the ninth commandment to these poor Danites. Right? Uh, I mean, not that the Danites are in the right, but... You know, again, in the in the scheme of all the wickedness here, right? At least the Danites are asking help from Jehovah to know if what they're doing is right, right? So there's like that slice of uh, of, of of holiness in the midst of all of this. Well, the problem is again, as the Levite, his communication with the Lord has been shut off a long time ago, right? The Lord is not hearing the prayers of the uh, of the Levite priest. But that's not going to stop the Levite priest from putting on a show for everybody. And he puts on this show, and guess what he says he heard from the Lord? <laughs> that everything's going to be great for you, right? Because do you think the, the, the Levite priest is going to say anything other than that? No, right? Because he's in the blessing business, right? He's going to tell you that everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be hunky-dory, Everything's be wonderful. You're going to live your best life now, right? This is, you know, one of the first health and wealth preachers in the Bible, right? You know, they tell you that God only wants to bless you. God only wants what's, what, what you desire, what you think's wonderful, what you think is great, and you go walk in your truth, right? That, that's what the Levite's saying here. Well, guess what? So the five men departed and went to the Laish. They saw uh, the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the mountain, in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians and they had no ties with anyone. Then the spies came back to their brethren Zor and Eshtel, and the brethren said to them, What is the report? So they said, Arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and indeed it is very good. Let me know if you've heard this story before. This isn't the first time that Israelites have sent spies in the land to tell them what's going on. Well, again, are there any Joshua's or Caleb among the Danites? 
No. So nobody's going to be telling the truth about anything. So, you know, they go up uh, to these people who are secure, uh, and they tell them uh, that God has given it into your hands a place where there's no lack of anything on the earth. And 600 men of the family of Danites went from there, from Zorah, and Eshel, armed with weapons of war. They went up and encamped in Kirjath, Jerim, and Judah. Therefore, they called the place Mahan Adan to this day. There it is, west of Kirjath, Jerim. And they passed from there to the mountains of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Do you know that there are in these houses an ephod house of idols, a carved image, and molded image? Now, therefore, consider what you should do. So they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah, and greeted him. The 700 men, armed with their weapons of war, who were the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Then the five men who had gone to spy the land went up. Entering there, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the mold image. The priest stood at the entrance of the gate with 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. When these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the mold image, the priest said, What are you doing? <laughs> And they said to him, Be quiet, put your hand over your mouth, and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. It is better for you to be a priest to the household of one man, or that you be priest to a tribe and a family in Israel. So the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod, the household idols, and the card image, and took his place among the people. Then they turned and departed, and put the little ones' livestock and the goods in front of them. When they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they called out the children of Dan, so they turned around and said to Micah, What ails you that you have gathered such a company? So he said, You have taken away my gods, which I made, and the priest, and you have gone away. Now what more do I have? How can you say to me what ails you? And the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry men fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. So here's all these you know, people being people. All right, the Danites realize, well, maybe it's the idols that have given Micah his blessing, so let's take the idols, and we know this priest is easily swayed, so uh, let's take him with us. You know, we know that he is a man of pride, a man of, uh, uh, of, of self, um, uh, you know, self-giving, so we'll pay you more than we paid Micah. And, of course, how does Micah react to uh, him losing his idols and his priests? He sounds upset, right? And then how do the Danites uh, respond when they realize that, or not so much realize, but see the anger of Micah? Yeah, they're pretty much telling him what? Bring it on, right? Uh, be careful, right? <laughs> Don't say the wrong thing here. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just amazing, right? The, the way that nothing has changed in the history of the world, right? You know, because again... Using 21st century language, let's say again that, that Mike is a drug dealer, or his mom's a drug dealer, right? He's gone and stolen this money back from somebody else. Uh, do you think those people he stole from are going to be like, well, uh, I guess we'll just have to write that off? No, right? They're going to want their money back, right? So, you know, again, this is just another example in the Bible where sin begets sin, which begets sin, which begets sin, which begets sin, right? There is... Just a non-stop avalanche here of the, uh, of the realities of wickedness. So then the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. Now, that verse tells us everything we need to know. Right, is he willing to fight for his God? You know, does he put much faith in the priests that he consecrated? Yeah. What do you think this says about Micah's... What do you think Micah's going to go back and say to his son who he's consecrated as a priest? <laughs> They're probably not going to have a warm conversation. Right? Because evidently the consecration didn't work. Right? It didn't, didn't take. Because here we have this priest who can't be a priest and these idols who can't do anything. But, again, those of us who are reading this story with the eyes of Christ, should we be surprised at any of it? We should never be surprised when sinners act like sinners. But we also need to be careful that we not look at this story as the Pharisees would and say, you know, boy, I'm glad I'm not Micah, uh, the, you know, the, the Ephraimite. You know, I'm glad I'm smarter than he is. But 
you think about idols and stuff and the way that idols work and the way that idols capture the mind, but also how easily idols are cast away. Especially when we do cost-benefit analysis and realize that those idols really aren't worth the trouble. And do you think, um, do you think that Micah here turns back to the Lord, of, Lord God, repents, and sees the error of his ways? No, right? What do you think Micah does? He probably goes finds himself some other idols to worship, right? Again, that's the nature of unbelief, right? That's why the Bible calls it folly. Because it does not learn from its mistakes, right? It does not learn from what takes place. So to close it out, we see that they take all, then I take all these things, and there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon. Uh, you know, they, they destroyed the city of Laish. Uh, it's in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. So they built the city and dwelt there. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel, having the name of the city from his Laish. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves carved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, remember, Ephraim, and now who do we have involved? Manasseh, the other tribe of Joseph. And can Manasseh make priests? No. But what we're told here is, is how long do they get away with their sin? Until the time of the captivity. You know, sometimes, and the psalmist talks about this a good bit, you know, sometimes we see the wickedness of man and we wonder why God's judgment doesn't come down upon them. Well, many times that is the way of God's judgment. Right? He allows the richer to become richer, right? to become numb to their sin and to their wickedness so they think right, that there is no judgment for their sin. But what do you think the Danites come to find out on the day of their death? That there is judgment, right? Because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And you know, it, it's not as if the Danites were ignorant of these things. It wasn't like the Manassites and the Ephraimites were ignorant. They knew what the Lord required. But because there was no immediate judgment, they thought they could get away with it. But of course we know better. And of course we're meant to learn that in this story. Just because God hasn't done something about our sin does not mean that he is not storing up wrath for the day of judgment. And so there's a, a great warning here uh, for all of us. We'll close on that. Any questions or comments or anything? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for your word and the way that your word uh, communicates to us. Again, the danger uh, of the way sin can often blind us uh, to reality. And to God, we pray that you would open our eyes to see our own sin, that we might not only repent, but that we might turn unto you. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.